The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us here to this place to hear your word. Lord, may it be proclaimed. May your spirit proclaim his word. May your truth go forth. May it change the lives of your people. May it save those who do not know you. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. So a mother, listening to the evening prayers of her sleepy little daughter, was astonished and amazed to hear the following, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and when he hollers, let him go, eeny, meeny, miny, (laughs) moe. Sometimes our prayers can get mottled and confused. And confusion uh, may come at times when we try to explain God in terms of our own understanding of Him. And so, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Habakkuk chapter 1. We'll be looking at verse 12. And I know, a.k.a. Habakkuk, I apologize to our guests, it is the book of Habakkuk. And um, I had someone uh, come up to me last Sunday and and in our conversation, this sweet saint said, um, when you were saying uh, Habakkuk, um, I, I turned to my spouse and said, um, I think he's trying to say Habakkuk. <laughs> <laughs> and that reminds me, A, uh, that uh, for the sake of our guests, um, we're in the, uh, the book of Habakkuk, so I, I want to make that clear. Uh, Habakkuk is just uh, the Hebrew pronunciation of the name. Um, but the second reminder is that um, God can use any idiot to proclaim his word. And it is his truth and his spirit that really bring the power of God's truth. So he can use a fool even as I to proclaim his word. So amen to, uh, to that. So if you would, turn with me to the book of Habakkuk, and we'll start in verse uh, 12. And, and just by way of reminder, our prophet is, is confused. Uh, he knows what he knows about God, um, but there are some things that seem to urge him and seem to be contradictory, so it leaves him at a place of confusion. So I I pray that you would give him a little grace and understanding because he does not have the full canon. He does not have the New Testament. And so I I think at times I myself need to repent of looking at men like this and standing in judgment over them. Hey, don't they understand that Romans says, don't they understand that Ephesians says hundreds of years prior to, to these, and we don't give them the grace of Hebrews 11, 13, It says, all these died in faith without receiving the promise. So they didn't have what we have. So let's give give this man some grace. So this morning, uh, just our outline, we're going to be looking at the prophet, uh, looking at uh, God and his second prayer. So we come to his second prayer. And this is praying through confusion. So he's affirming God's character in verse 12. Um, and then confusion over God's favor in the first part of verse 13. Then confu- confusion over the continual oppression of the righteous in the second part of verse 13. And then confusion over the request, the uh, conquest and the continued conquest of the wicked, verses 14 through 17. And then um, in 2 1, receptivity to the correction of God. And then we'll step into chapter 2, verses 2 through 3 where uh, God says, I will bring my, about my plans. And then uh, verse 4, I will give life. And then verse 5, I will expose the wicked. And then verses 6 through 8, where we'll end this morning, Lord willing, with the first woe, there's a set of five of these, these woes where he says, I will judge through other nations. So let's start in verse 12. 
Are you not from everlasting, O God, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look at wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? So first blush, verses 12 through 13, the prophet establishes and recognizes who God is. He says, are you not from everlasting? Um, a very similar phrase used in Isaiah 37, 26 through 29. Um, uh, ancient times is, is the phrase he's using. And, and so he's looking back and he's seeing that God has established himself and established his plans before there was even time. Um, and in the, the Isaiah 37, 26 through 29 passage, this is Isaiah the prophet relating uh, to the prophet to give to the king, to give to Sennacherib, who was the Assyrian uh, king who was, who was taunting Israel. And, he's, and he says, are you not from, from everlasting as he establishes God? And he says, hey, hey, Sennacherib, if you're poking God in the chest, and that's exactly what he was doing, I'm going to declare myself, and I'm going to show you my power. And then he goes, and, and the angel of the Lord slaughters 180,000 in one night. Assyrians just, boom. So God establishes himself. So these plans that God had were established before there was time. So um, the prophet here is acknowledging, are you not from everlasting? Mainly, have you not planned this? Isn't this where, what you have planned? So uh, then he uses three names. He says, O Lord, my God, my Holy One, uh, Elohim, Elo uh, Yahweh Elohim Kadosh, Yahweh Elohim Kadosh, um, Lord, God, Holy One. These all have deep meaning, and he's, and he's stringing them together. In these names, the prophets acknowledging that God keeps his covenants from the foundation of the world that he created and upholds with his power by his holiness. That's who he is. So he's establishing, he's recognizing this. He's reminding himself who God is, who it is that he is dealing with. And thus, this is going to build into why the confusion. And then he makes the statement, we will not die. So Sean read for you this morning in Psalm 118, so we don't have to, to turn there again, but Psalm 118, 15 through 18, David makes this very similar statement. I shall not die. Well, is this a statement that David was making saying, I'm never going to die. Well, he's dead. So that doesn't make any sense. So what is he, what is he saying? What is he saying? He's saying that I'm not going to be wiped out. Evilness might be around me, but it won't be by that demise that I'm going to come to an end. So as he's saying, we shall not die, he's, he's establishing or he's making that statement that Israel won't be wiped out. He realizes that, that Judah, because of God's covenant-keeping love for his people, won't be totally wiped out. He recognizes that. So, in recognizing who God is, and then he moves to the next statement. So he agrees with God, you, O rock, have established them to correct. So he calls God a rock, but he also acknowledges that this judgment is rightly coming, and he says, yes, I recognize that the Babylonians are the ones that are going to be the ones that you're going to use. Kind of a similar structure, maybe had uh, Deuteronomy 32.4 in mind when it came to this. But he said, oh, rock. Okay, so yes, I see that it's you who is judging. And you've established them to correct. But then he makes the statement, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness, um, with favors implied in the um, translation there. So what is he saying? You're too clean. You're too pure. You can't look at evil. This connects with that thought of God being holy. You're holy. 
So you can't approve, you can't look at evil, you can't look at wickedness and, and be favorable about it. Thus my confusion is what he goes into. So given that, given that you are who you say you are, given all this is true, why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? These seem to be in contradiction to one another. I'm confused. I'm confused. And then he makes a uh, comparative statement. Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those who are more righteous than they? Now, <clears throat> yes, we can get uh, critical of the comparison made here and say, well, in comparison to God and his holiness, Romans 3.10, also quoting Isaiah, um, there's none righteous, no, not one. So why is he making a comparative statement? Doesn't he see that there's actually none righteous, not even one? And if we attack the passage in that way, we miss the argument that he's making. The argument's not surrounding the comparison. The argument is surrounding God's inaction. Why are you silent? That's the question. Why are you silent when those who are righteous swallow up those who are basically less righteous? It's a polite way, by way of reference, you can reference this in 1 Samuel 24, 17, 2 Samuel 4:11. 1 Kings 2.32, and, and other passages. It's a polite way of saying um, there's a righteous and there's a wicked. There's an unrighteous. But he's being a little more polite. He's not just calling them out as wicked. Think about it. The Babylonians were treacherous. The Babylonians were awful. The Babylonians were idolatrous. And uh, Israel and Judah, specifically the southern kingdom of Israel, with all of its faults, still their God, the representative God, was the God of the Bible. And still there were those, be them a remnant, in Israel, in Judah, who praised and worshipped the one true God. So the comparison fits... His concern then is, God, you're not doing anything as the righteous slowly become extinct. Do you get the concern? The righteous are slowly going into extinction. So he is concerned, yes, you'll preserve Israel. Yes, you'll preserve Judah. But who's going to be left that are actually righteous, that actually follow in your way. I hope that makes sense. What he's struggling through, what he's, what he's contemplating. Again, give him grace. He doesn't have the New Testament. He doesn't have everything that we have. He doesn't have 2020 sight on this. All right? So he makes his case, verses 15 through 17. Um, uh, uh, 14 through 17. Why have you made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? The Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net, because through these things their catch is is large and their food is plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? He's, he's got a concern. And he sees Babylon. So first he starts with an analogy. He, he, he uses two. He uses one regarding fish and one regarding insects. Okay, creeping things. Right? The analogy, analogy of the fish, uh, one biologist put it this way, and this, this is probably what the prophet had in mind. A bait ball, bait ball, B-A-I-T, bait ball, occurs when small fish swarm in a tight-packed spherical formation about a common center. It is a last-ditch defense measure adopted by small schooling fish when they are threatened by predators. Sardines do this. Sardines, a favorite of the dolphin, and the dolphin creates a situation where they, they swim around the fish until these fish clump like this, become a bait ball, and what does it make then? A, a big old ball 
of bait or a big old ball of fish easy for the predator to come in and snatch. Okay, this is the analogy the prophet's using. He's saying, you've made us like a big old bait ball. It's easy for the predator, i.e. Babylon, to come in and snatch us up. And then he uses the other analogy uh, regarding um, uh, insects. And if you've ever, uh, if you know anything about ants, if you kill the queen in an ant colony, what happens to the colony? The whole colony goes, just dies. Don't know what to do. They're just done. It's over. So he uses this same analogy. And at the time, Judah had a very weak, very wicked king. And, and therefore, they were ripe for the plucking. Judah was in trouble. And so the prophet recognizes this. So they're vulnerable. And not only are they vulnerable, all the nations or the uh, known world of the time are vulnerable like this, ripe for the plucking. And what he's bringing forth as his arguments is who's going to stop them? No one's going to stop them. They're just going to continue to roll over person and nation after nation after nation. No one's going to be able to take them down. And they're just going to go about their merry way. And look at them. They're, they're happy. They're smiling. And what do they celebrate? They don't celebrate you, God. It's not in righteousness that they celebrate. It's in their own strength that they celebrate. It's in their own power that they celebrate. And he's saying, God, they're not even recognizing you in this. They're flexing their muscles and pounding their chest and saying, we're number one. And they're getting away with it. So one might argue, okay, well, Psalm 73, the Psalm of Asaph was in place. Why didn't he just go there? Well, the Psalm of Asaph is a man struggling with um, jealousy over the wicked. I wish I had what they had. I wish I had the success that they had. Do you see the contrast to what the argument in Habakkuk is? It's not the same one. It's not, I wish I had what they had. I wish we were conquering the world. It's not a jealousy issue. It's a concern over the righteous. It's a concern that they're going to get exterminated. It's a concern that uh, no one's going to be able to stop them. It's a concern over um, evil touting itself. So there's, there's some rightful concerns that the prophet has. And so underpinning this, there might be a hope. That as the prophet is appealing to God and saying, do you understand that this is what's going on, that these are the kinds of people they are, there's possibly a hope underneath the surface that's looking to uh, a Jonah 3.10, okay? And for those of you who are familiar with Jonah and the, what happened there, Jonah goes to Assyria, I'll skip all the other stuff in the story, but he basically goes to Assyria and goes to Nineveh and he proclaims God's going to destroy you. The people repent and God relents, doesn't destroy him. And so there could be this hope underneath the surface with the prophet saying, please do it this way. Look how awful these people are. Don't you realize, God, you're the only one. Once we go down, once Judah goes down, there's going to be no one to stop them. There's going to be no one to stop them. So he's got some pretty tight, logical arguments. So this is a good pause point for us to stop and remind ourselves, the end-all, be-all is not our logic, but our theology. So just because something is logical does not make it theological. So just because, yeah, I can reason this doesn't mean it's correct. And I know we get to skip ahead, we get to see what's coming as he gets his theology right. But it, this should serve as a reminder to us. We get here. We get to the, these places of confusion. And why do we get confused? Because we're letting other things come in 
and say, this is the way it is. Greg was, was teaching this morning in Thessalonians, listening to the whispers that say, God doesn't love you. There's no way since you're suffering hardship that there's approval that you are walking right, et cetera, et cetera. You need to be careful. You need to make sure that our minds are theological as they are logical. Because God's logic is hyper-logical, above logic. So um, kind of also in, in reflecting at this passage, we, we look at the way the Babylonians are described as chest thumpers, as people who praise themselves, and we say, bad are they. What about us? What about our country? What about us personally? We need to take this to heart. Not to be arrogant, chest thumpers, when we succeed, when we do well, do we forget God? Maybe not to the magnitude that the Babylonians did, but still a little bit of this is just as dangerous. A drop of cyanide in a bucket of water is still deadly. So let's be careful. Let's be careful. That brings us to 2, chapter 2, verse 1. And this is his receptivity to correction. So the prophet says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. So he uses quite vivid language. He describes himself as a watchman. They were the people in the tallest tower that looked out for the first sign of trouble or a messenger. So a person stationed in a very high tower could see a runner coming from a very far distance and call down, runner coming! so that they were ready to receive the message, so that they were ready to open the gates, welcome that messenger in, and welcome the message. And that's the depiction here that the prophet is using. But what I really want us to focus on is his patience. He says, I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. He says, I'm, I'm going to watch, I'm going to wait. Now, do we push God's timeline sometimes? God, I need that answer, and I need it a little quicker than you're giving it. Hurry up. So, yes, the prophet has confusion. Yes, he is asking questions. But he says, I'll wait. I'll wait patiently. I'll, look, I'll wait longingly to hear from you. So there's something to take away from that. And then the beauty of this, and how I may reply when I am reproved. So I want us to turn to Proverbs 15.31. And look at this, this Hebrew word, tokaka, tokaka, reproof, correction. If you have the NIV, it, it, it translates it differently and it, and it loses its point. Um, uh, how I will reply once he replies to my complaint or something to that extent. Um, that's not what's being said. This uh, tokaka is used here in uh, Proverbs 15, verses 31 through 32. It says, he, who, he whose ear listens to the life-giving reproof, tokaka, there it is, will dwell among the wise. He who neglects discipline despises himself. But he who listens to reproof, tokaka, acquires understanding. Listen to the way 
the heart of the prophet is receiving or ready to receive. There's humility here. He's saying, I'm ready for him to correct me. And here's why I say humility. Um, because, um, y- yeah, there's a good test and there's a debate about um, is, is humility tested better when you succeed or when you fail? I, I would offer you a third option. I think humility is really tested when you're corrected. That's where true humility shows or, or doesn't show. So if you're corrected and your first response is self-defense and defending me and how I approach this and what I did, that's not hitting on humility. Psalm 141.5, David says, let the righteous smite me. Word, strike. Let the righteous smite me. It is oil to my head. Let the righteous smite me, it is oil to my head. He's looking at it as favor, as medicine, as honor to be corrected. Do we have this heart? Do we have the same heart that the prophet has? Yeah, he has his questions. We have our questions too. We have our times where we go through things, yes. But do we have this heart where we're willing to receive correction and reproof? Yeah, I'm willing to receive correction and reproof from from God, but not other people. Way to hide behind the truth. It's not, not it. It's not it. So this this is where I I really believe Job went off the rails. Um, Job 31-35 he essentially said, God, you owe me. You owe me an answer. And I wish there was somebody between us that could decide and I could argue my case, basically. You could see how right I am. That's, that's not the prophet here. That's not Habakkuk. He's not saying that. He's saying, and how I may reply when I am reproved. How do you reply when you're reproved? Is it defensive? Is it angry? Or is it humble? And so he's really looking at his heart. So I I hope you see that because it's it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful heart there. Heart willing to receive. So that brings us to God now. To two. Then the Lord answered me and said, record the vision and then scribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. Certainly come, it, come. it will not delay. So there's several things going on. Um, he uses the word, he says, record the vision and record it on loach, tablet. And a tablet was made of wood or stone or metal. Wood or stone or metal. Not papyrus. What can you do on papyrus that you can't do on wood and stone and metal? Correction, what I meant to say, right? This is why we're not in college with tink, 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 right? Because we make mistakes. The teacher makes mistakes, but God doesn't make mistakes. And what he says is what's going to happen is going to happen for sure. Now, what just happened with that statement? What just happened? Let's let's tie that back to that possible underlying hope. It's gone. It's gone. This is the way it's going to happen. The Babylonians are coming. 
They're coming for sure, and they're coming soon. Okay, thus the statement, though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, it will not delay. It's coming. Think about that in terms of Christ and his coming. He said he's coming. And this applies. Meaning, not, not this Babylonian captivity judgment, but that his word is sure. He said he's going to come. He said he's going to come soon. And he's going to come soon. Are you ready? It says... Um, in a lot of part of verse 2, it says that the one who reads it may run. Okay, there's a right way and a wrong way to understand this. If this means run away, that you, that you hear about this and run away, we, it creates a problem. Okay, in Jeremiah 27, 8 through 11, and Jeremiah 42, 9 through 17, the prophet Jeremiah explicitly states to Judah, don't run away from your judgment. Go and take your, lump, your lumps. Go and be under this judgment. This is for you. This is for Judah. Do not run away from it. In Jeremiah, there was a group that wanted to run away from it. They wanted to fight it, and then when they couldn't fight it, they ran away from it and went to Egypt. And Jeremiah says, no, go back there. Go back there. And I will bless you as you are under the judgment. Otherwise, you think this is bad? It's going to get worse for you because I'm going to chase after you. I'm going to judge you for not taking your lumps. So um, this can't be run away. Okay? The NIV uh, pro properly puts this as runs to give a message. That's the proper understanding. That the runner is coming, so I'm going to give you this. It's a sure thing. And so whoever hears this may run and tell everybody and say, it's coming, the judgment is coming, be prepared. And these are the messengers we are supposed to be as well with the gospel. All right. So that brings us to probably one of the most familiar passages that you did not realize was actually in this book. Verse 4 says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. Ah! You heard that one before? Probably, probably. We're going to get there. Um, furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. So these thoughts are, are connected. So we've got before us a very familiar verse. The righteous shall live by faith. It is quoted in Romans 1.17. It is quoted in Galatians 3.11. It is quoted, and, and even more so, in Hebrews 10.37-38. through 38. They're all quoting Habakkuk. They're all quoting the prophet. And in all of those contexts, the uh, main thrust is salvation. It's the main thrust. But I want us to, to stay in our context. So I don't... I'm not going to take us to those passages. If you've got a community group, I hope you get to study this. Because I hope you get a chance to look at those passages in parallel to this. Okay, it says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by faith. So we've, we're, we're getting some contrast here. We have a proud, we have a righteous, which aren't direct contradictions. Um, and we have a life and an implied no life. It says his soul, the proud one, his soul is not right within him. So um, he's, he's making, God's making this declaration and he's saying those who are 
proud. It's a heart issue. And it demonstrates a lack of something that's on the other side of this argument. Faith. There's no faith. There's no faith in God, and therefore the soul is not there. And the word soul is nafesh in Hebrew, which can also be translated life. His life is not right within him. Of course his life is not right within him. A person who has no faith has no life. And that's the contrast he's making in saying, the righteous shall live by faith. What was one of the concerns of the prophet? That the righteous were going to be eliminated. Right? You're, you're taking us out of your country. You're taking us away from the temple. You're taking us away from your presence. But you know what? God's everywhere. And it's whoever is faithful to God that will live. And not the proud. Here's what I want us to notice, because this is important. I want us to see what is not in this verse. Okay, in this verse... Throughout the arguments made, there has been a contrast of the Babylonians and the Jews. The Babylonians and the Jews. What is not contrasted? It isn't saying the Babylonian soul is not right within him, but the Israelites will live by faith. It's not saying that. It blows it open. It's anybody Anybody, you can be a proud Jew and be wrong. You can be a faithful Babylonian and be right. There's a good King Nebuchadnezzar that's probably really excited to hear that. As is quoted in Daniel 4, 34 through 37, where Nebuchadnezzar declares God as God. The God, the only God the sovereign of all, and he worships him. So it's important to see that, and it's important to take that thought into those New Testament passages. So here's what I want to make sure that we see, is it doesn't matter what your skin color is or what your background is as you sit here today. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter... What matters is that the righteous shall live by faith. And if you live by faith, you, my brother, you, my sister, are my brother, are my sister. And we will worship our God for all eternity. This is a huge passage whose implications are far reaching. Life is granted by faith. A faithful life displays a faith that has life given by God. Okay? So verse 5, how does this connect? Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man. There's our connection, right? Behold, as to the proud one, his soul is not right within him. So it's connecting to the proud one. And it says, wine betrays the haughty man. Why are we talking about wine? Um, it was a Babylonian thing. They liked their wine. They got hammered. And a matter of fact, if you read in Daniel, this is exactly the way the king Belshazzar went down. He went down celebrating, drinking heartily. Yay, hooray for us. As the Medes, Darius the Medes, slowly went in, and took over the city of Babylon. So um, it says, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. So uh, drunkenness, when you're, when you're drunk, what does it do? It lowers your inhibitions and makes you more susceptible to being the piece of work that you are. 
okay? And that's, that's all of us, folks. We're, we're still we're sinners saved by grace, but uh, that's, why, um, that's why God speaks against it, speaks against drunkenness. So, uh, so it does. It betrays him for who he is. So he doesn't stay at home, so he enlarges his appetite like Sheol. So, um, so he's going out and he's getting more. He's going out and he's getting more and getting more and getting more, and he's collecting and he's gathering. He's restless. He's greedy. He's ambitious. And there's a reason why God's making this statement. Because it's going to connect to our next set of verses, verses 6 through 8, and address an issue that the prophet has. He says, you're blessing these people. You're showing them favor. And, and God's saying, yeah, just like a drunken man who goes out and gets more and more and more and more, and his appetite's never satisfied. He just keeps going. It sounds like, if you leave it there, blessing, blessing, blessing. It's all good, good, good. Until you read verses 6 through 8. Let's read this, verses 6 through 8. Will not... All of these take up a taunt song against him, even mockery and insinuations against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. For how long? And makes himself rich with loans. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who collect from you awaken? Indeed, you will become plunder for them because you have looted many nations, all the remainder of the peoples will loot you because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town, and all its in inhabitants. And you're like, wow, okay, now we're into it. This is the Minor Prophets, right? Judgment, nice. Here's the thing. Connect these thoughts to what he just said in five. He said he goes out and he gets more and more and more and more. Well, the thing is, What's, what God is describing it as, as he's going out and he is rich because he has borrowed. And he's borrowed. And he's borrowed. All right? This guy, it's, it's as if he's a guy with a $20 million mansion and you're going, great, that's success. Oh, wait. Wait, wait. He's got 100,000 creditors. Oh, pro no, not good. Not good. Because what happens when the term comes due and the person has no money? Do you end up with happy creditors? You end up with really upset creditors. So it's, it's like... The picture that's being painted here, it's, it's like a man, okay, his enemy, he's, he's a man uh, who, who's very greedy, and he owns a small rowboat, okay? Picture this. So there's a man, he's a really greedy man, and he owns a small rowboat, and his enemy, knowing his nature, tells him of a cave filled with tons of gold, but it lays across a crocodile-infested water. Okay? Now, at first, by recommending, here's where all the gold is, it sounds like favor. Right? But now you take into thought his nature. He's greedy. What's he going to do? He's going to go across, he's going to go to that cave, and he's going to start stacking up gold. And he's going to stack up gold. And when is he going to stop? When he swamps his boat in crocodile-infested waters. Oops. Right? He's not going to know it until it's too late. That's the picture being painted. That's the picture being painted here. So yeah, he's rich, but he's rich on loans. And the, pers the nations that he rolls over are going to come back on him. And that's exactly what happened. The Medo-Persian Empire rose out of this and became strong 
and conquered the Babylonians because they were fat, dumb, and happy. They sat complacently by through hundreds of years and were taken. So we're ending on kind of this bummer of a statement here, this woe, this judgment. But what I want us to see is what God is starting to communicate to the prophet. And that is, he is wise in his plans. He is wise. And his works are incredible. We just don't see it all. You see, through God's wisdom, through God's power, he preserved Daniel and his friends. He saved them from a fiery furnace. He saved an idolatrous king from himself. He shut the mouths of lions to declare himself as God. All of these would not have occurred without this awful Babylonian judgment. People came to know Christ. God was put on display in all of these things. Yes, the Babylonian judgment was horrific. No, God was not going to let it pass by unnoticed. He was going to deal with it. And he's declaring, this is what I do. He has declared to him, this is who I am, as we saw last week. And now he's beginning to declare to him, this is what I do. This is what I do. So the call for us then is, Will we trust a trustworthy God whose plans are perfect though we might not see them as such because we don't have his wisdom. We don't have his knowledge. He is God. Will we trust him? Will we trust his perfect plan? So I close with this, a poem from Mrs. Ross Jameson, she writes, If the sun were always shining and the skies were always blue, and the flowers always blooming and the trees a bright green hue, if the morn were always cheerful and the nights all clear and bright and the birds were always singing, never needing to take flight, we would soon grow tired and weary and oft complain and sigh for we'd miss the lovely rainbow that God put in the sky. Yes, we'd miss the rain and shadow and fleecy clouds of white. We'd miss the stars and moonlight and winter's chilly bite. Then we'd never know the rapture of the first snow of the year, nor the shout of happy youngsters yelling, whoopee, winter's here. If we could have all our wishes come true at our command, soon we'd want to change things back to the way that God had planned. Let's close in prayer. God, you are perfect in every way. Though we might be confused at times and not understand all the ramifications of everything, it just reminds us that we are not you. We are but created beings. We are but dust. But you, you and your goodness have saved you in your graciousness, preserve by faith. Thank you that in you we can rest, in your perfect plan, in your sovereign hand, that we can rest, even when it looks to be a hopeless situation. God, you are still at work. God, you are who you say you are. And in that we can rest. So we pray now that you would go with us, that you would make us a people that trusts in you, a people that's ready to receive, that's eager to hear, ready to be reproved. Thank you. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.
The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.